Esteemed colleague Ignatiev, we are delighted to welcome you here today as our new Kleveringa professor. It is a particular honor for the whole Leiden community that you are giving this year's Kleveringa lecture. As you know, Rudolf Kleveringa delivered his famous lecture 73 years ago on this very day in this very building. His lecture was a protest against the dismissal of his Jewish colleague, Eduard Maurits Meyers. As dean of the Faculty of Law, Kleveringa felt compelled to express publicly his abhorrence of the German occupiers' removal of all Jewish professors and other staff from the university. Meyers himself should have been standing in Kleveringa's place, lecturing to the students. All those in the great, great auditorium, Groot Auditorium, were in no doubt that they were witnessing an impressive act of civic courage. Civic courage is the subject of your lecture today. Kleveringa's address met with Lord applause. One of the students started to sing the Dutch national anthem, and many of those present had tears in their eyes. Kleveringa fully expected to be arrested. He had told his wife that he was what he was planning to do and had packed a suitcase in readiness. Indeed, he was arrested by the security police the following day and imprisoned in Scheveningen. Ironically, this prison was also known as the Orange Hotel, named after the Dutch royal family. Following Kleveringa's protest, the Leiden students decided to take action and staged a strike, something Kleveringa had never anticipated nor attended. After that, the occupying powers closed down our university. Leiden University established the Kleveringa chair in 1970 to commemorate this courageous act. The post is held each year by a different professor, but the focus of the chair remains the same, law, freedom and responsibility. Reflecting writing and speaking on these themes certainly feature strongly in your work. The numerous books you have written on modern warfare and human rights issues show this clearly. You wrote The Lesser Evil, Political Ethics in an Age of Terror in 2004. In this work you ask, how can Western societies remain faithful to liberal values of openness and freedom when the need to defeat terrorism often calls for secrecy and coercion. You wrote the book in response to the events of 9-11, but the topic <coughs> it covers are more relevant today than ever. We only have to think of the non-stop stream of news reports following the revelations made by Edward Snowden and the bugging operations by the NSA. The lesser evil is relatively abstract in terms of content. Finding the right design for the cover of such books can be a challenge for, pub for publishers. For the US edition, Princeton University Press opted for a dark, gloomy staircase that brings to mind a torture chamber. The cover of the German translation depicts a man peering at a bank of computer screens, monitoring activities at a railway station. Gosset, the publisher of the Dutch translation, opted for a completely different approach. This edition shows a detail from the, Saint Temp the, the Temptation of Saint Anthony, a painting by your own boss, and it depicts a village in flames surrounded by flying devils and demons. The painting dates back some 500 years and tells the story of the mental and spiritual torments endured by St. Anthony the Great. He had retreated to the Egyptian desert where he was plagued by devils. They tried all possible means to divert him from his pious way of life. They even appeared before him in the guise of an attractive woman, but Anthony remained steadfast and resisted all their efforts. 
art historians interpret the burning village as a reference to an illness known as St. Anthony's fire, a condition caused by eating contaminated grain. In fact, I believe your Dutch publisher intended a very different association with this cover, 9-11. Then, too, we were confronted with images of burning buildings and with an horrific vision of demonic, the demonic evil sweeping across the skies. Boss's late medieval image is an exceptionally good match for a book inspired by the attacks of 9-11. In the wake of these attacks, many Western countries introduced emergency measures to combat terrorism. In the United States, and Great Britain in particular, special exceptions were made to citizens' rights and freedoms. You argue in The Lesser Evil that liberal states consistently overreact and are all too eager to curtail, curtail freedoms. A liberal democracy can survive the age of terror only if it takes seriously the political context within which terrorism thrives. That is, by championing and engaging with social justice. Seen in this light, the temptation of St. Anthony presents an unforeseen parallel with the temptations to which Western democracies today are exposed. Just like Anthony, they too need to stand firm, remain faithful to their deepest convictions and not succumb to the evil that calls itself terrorism. Esteemed colleague Ignatiev, it is not often that we have a Cleveringa professor in our midst who is as multi-talented as yourself. Trained as an historian, you have worked by turns as a screenwriter, essayist, columnist, memoirist, BBC television host, biographer of the philosopher Isaiah Berlin, novelist and war correspondent. You are an authority on ethics and international affairs. You were born in Canada, but you lived in the United Kingdom for over 20 years between 1978 and 2000. You became well known as a television and radio broadcaster and as a columnist for The Observer, The New Yorker and The New York Times. Your documentary series, Blood and Belonging, Journeys into the New Nationalism, was screened by the BBC in 1993. It won a Canadian Gemini Award and the book of the same name based on the series won several prizes. Your family memoir, The Russian Album, received prestigious awards as well. Your novel's card issue was shortlisted for the 1994 Booker Prize, and then in 2000 you left Britain to take up a position at Harvard University as the director, as the director of the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at the John F. Kennedy School of Government. For most people, such a career would be more than enough, but not for you. In 2005, at the age of 50, 58, you transformed yourself into a politician. And that, despite having no proven political record and having lived outside your native Canada for the previous 30 years. You became a member of parliament and in 2008 you were leader of the opposition Liberal Party. You were poised, should the governing Conservatives falter, to become Canada's next prime minister. But that was not to be. In the 2011 federal election, you lost your seat in Parliament and the Liberal Party lost its position as an official opposition. In that same year, you announced your resignation as leader of the Liberal Party. And now you have returned to your professional roots, writing and teaching. Your latest book appeared this month, published by Harvard University Press, <laughs> Fire and Ashes, Success and failure in politics. You told about it in Buitenhof last Sunday. In this book, we can read what you took away from your crash course in politics. You argue that many of the apparent vices of political life, such as the inconsistencies and fake smiles, follow from the need to bridge differences in a pluralistic society. You currently teach at the University of Toronto's Monk School of Global Affairs and, again, at Harvard. For our students here in Leiden, you, will be, you, you are an exceptional opportunity 
they will, they will have an exceptional opportunity to benefit from your teaching. We are delighted to have you here and are now keen to hear your inaugural address. In the seclusion of this academic senate, I extend a warm welcome to you. Dan gaan wij naar het grote auditorium en de volgorde der faculteiten zal zijn de sociale wetenschappen, de archeologie, de faculteit Campus Den Haag, de faculteit der geesteswetenschappen, rechten, geneeskunde en tenslotte wiskunde en natuurwetenschappen. Uh, Rector Magnificus, I hope you'll um, allow me to doff my hat in a respectful manner. Uh, my wife says I look like an incompetent baker in this hat. I intend no disrespect to this institution. I think I will do better without my hat. Um, Rector, members of the faculty, uh, Cleveringa family, ambassador, my Publishers, Cosse from Amsterdam, Susanna, my wife, students, members of this community. It's a obvious, a great honor to talk to you this afternoon. And I have some trepidation doing so because I'm about to tell you a story that you know possibly better than I do. A story that's part of the fabric and heart and soul of this university. I do so because sometimes when a stranger comes to a village and tells the village a story that they have heard many times, sometimes the stranger is able to find something in the story 
that leaves us all understanding something anew. And so I'm going to tell you a story you know, and if I have got any part of the story wrong, I hope afterwards you will correct me, and I hope that I will learn from what you have to say. At 10 o'clock on the morning of November 26, 1940, six months into the Nazi occupation of Holland, a 46-year-old father of three, the dean of Leiden University Law School, walked into a lecture hall, this very hall, full of students awaiting a class on civil law from Professor E.M. Myers, and told them that Myers had been dismissed from his post for being Jewish. The dean, Rudolf Cleveringa, read out the text of the Reichskommissar dismissal notice, and in his own words, the icy grip of terrible silence descended upon the lecture hall. The dean might have stopped there, but instead he offered a laudatio to a man he considered a mentor and a friend. Cleverenga enumerated the academic achievements of Myers and praised him as one of the most distinguished professors of civil law in Europe. And then he said this, famous words, it is this Dutchman, this noble and true son of our people, this man, this father to students, this scholar, that the foreigner who now dominates us relieves of his function. I told you that I would not speak of my feelings. I will keep my word even though they threaten to burst like boiling lava through all the cracks which I feel at moments could open under the pressure in my head and heart. In the Netherlands, I don't need to tell you, these words are famous. In their passion and decency, they spoke up for the connections between citizens, scholars, human beings, and friends that the occupiers sought to rip apart. But Cleveringa had not finished. He reminded his students that the Dutch Constitution guarantees the right to public employment to all and gives each citizen equal civil rights. Furthermore, the Hague Convention, respecting the laws and customs of war on land, adopted in 1907, required an occupying power to respect the laws of the occupied country, sauf empêchement absolu. Cleveringa pointed out there was no empêchement whatever. The dismissal, he clearly implied, was illegal under both Dutch and international law. The dean then urged the students not to do anything foolish and to submit, as he had done, to force majeure. And he concluded by telling them that the class would continue to be taught, either by him or by his colleagues, and that with faith and hope, they would await the return of Myers, who one day, God willing, would resume his rightful place. Let me draw your attention to the significance of this quietly spoken concluding note. To speak of the hope that Myers would return pointed to a day when the occupiers would be gone and Dutch freedom would be restored. And this evocation of a future in freedom helps explain why at the conclusion of the lecture, the words of the national anthem, the Wilhelmus, were taken up by one student and then spread from voice to voice throughout this hall and to the crowd listening in an overflow room. Leveringa left his lecture on this podium. A colleague picked it up and students retyped copies throughout the night. Next day it was circulated to universities throughout the Netherlands. In the following week, a peaceful student strike began at Leiden and it was the first such demonstration, as you know, in occupied Europe. In response, the occupied occupation authorities closed the university. After the lecture, Leveringa went home to his wife and daughters that evening, Myers came to see him once more. They were both resigned to the consequences. Leveringa's suitcase was already packed and ready in the hall. Arrest came next day at the hands of the Dutch police acting under orders from the Germans. When the Germans interrogated him, they wanted to know whether he was Jewish, and he said he wasn't. Why then had he angered the Nazi authorities? He said he had no right or desire to anger anyone. Why, but hadn't he provoked a political demonstration that ended with the singing of the band national anthem? He said he had no desire to provoke. He had merely spoken up on an issue of principle. The Germans had no authority to dismiss a university professor. 
As punishment for his action, Cleveringa spent November 1940 to the summer of 1941 in the prison of Schengen-Ingen, which also served as a transit camp where Dutch Jews were soon to be assembled for deportation and for extermination. Leveringa was not deported, but he was dismissed, and while he received a pension, he was unable to teach at the university. He joined resistance movements with fellow colleagues, was imprisoned again from January to July 1944 at the transit camp of Vught. His colleague, great man, Ben Telders, a prominent figure in the Dutch Liberal Party, was arrested in 1940, confined in a variety of Dutch prisons, and then deported to Germany, where he was confined in Sachsenhausen. He was moved to Bergen-Belsen and died of typhus there before the liberation of Germany in April 1945. As for Myers, he was sent to Westerbork Transit Camp in Holland, then deported to Theresienstadt with his family. But he managed to stay alive by working in the camp administration. He was released upon the collapse of Germany in May 1945 and made his way back to Leiden, emaciated and weakened by his ordeal. But Cleveringa's faith was proven true. In September 1945, Myers resumed teaching his class and did so until his death in 1954. Cleveringa himself returned quietly to university work after the war and died in 1980. This university is right to commemorate the civil courage of this man. Without Leiden, it is fair to say, no Cleveringa. His speech embodied traditions that date back to the founding of this university by William of Orange in 1575 at the beginning of the Dutch revolt against the Spanish occupation. Leiden's motto, Presidium Libertatis, Bastion of Liberty, affirms this community's enduring understanding of the interdependence of academic and political freedom. And this lecture, my lecture, is about the connection between civil courage and the moral imagination. In his great essay, A Defense of Poetry, written in 1821, the poet Shelley wrote, the great instrument of moral good is the imagination. I want to take this remark seriously and use Cleveringa's example to explore the constitutive role of the imagination in making civil courage possible. Civil courage, which is the bravery of citizens and civilians, is very different from the courage of soldiers, sailors, sailors, and airmen. The ability to take risk with your life, the ability to endure and rise above pain and danger, is a different courage from the quiet kind that consists in defending a friend at the price of imprisonment and dismissal. Yet both civil and military courage are mysterious virtues capable of surprising even those who display them. Courageous people will commonly tell you that they did not know they had it in them. Courage is mysterious in another way too. Military training for generations, for millennia, has sought to teach courage to young men in arms, yet it remains a virtue that's fundamentally unteachable. You'll never know whether you're capable of courage until the situation arises. And if your courage fails, it can shame your whole life. Cleveringa's act was luminous, but the light it casts upon us is mysterious. We commemorate it because we wish it to serve as an example. But what exactly can we learn from it? In this very hall where Cleveringa gave his speech, I want to use his own words taken from his memoirs and from the memories of those who were there to try to understand how a single act of courage became possible. And I want to put the imagination back at the center of both exceptional and ordinary moral lives. I want to claim that it's how we imagine ourselves, then others, then time present, past, and future that enables us to understand the moral dilemmas we face and rise to them. None of this is a given. The facts never speak for themselves. We have to imagine a future audience for our acts, and no such, no such future necessarily exists. We will that future into being. 
It is this imagined future that called Cleveringa to bear witness, and it is this imagined tomorrow, I would argue, that calls us to do the right thing today. I'm implying in further that our moral judgment is never solitary, never just ours alone. It is an exercise of justification before others, even if those others are imagined. We have to explain ourselves before them with reasons and see whether these reasons succeed or fail with them. Our conscience, I would argue, is a theater a theater that we people with an audience of our own choosing. And we go wrong in life if we people that audience with those we know in advance will approve of what we're about to do. We go right in life if we can justify our actions before an audience that is not capable of being swayed by our wish to be justified. And one audience we cannot sway is the future, that imagine those imagined figures in our mind's eye waiting to pass judgment upon us. Because we cannot know what they will think of us, we attach special importance to their verdict. They are what Adam Smith called the impartial spectators of our moral life. I want to show how this metaphor of the theater of the imagination helps us to understand how one brave man framed his choices and acted as he did. And in taking this approach, I'm going to compare it to two current ways of thinking about moral life. And the first of these could be called the neurological instinctive. This is the influential school of moral psychology that says, in effect, that moral judgment is the psychic result of a biochemical process, a firing of neurons and synapses structured over millennia by evolutionary adaptation. This school of thought wants to capture how quick, how intuitive our moral judgments feel to us, how little our moral reactions appear to depend on a process of rational evaluation. To use Daniel Kahneman's famous distinction between thinking fast and thinking slow, when we make moral judgments, we think fast. Indeed, the process hardly feels like thinking at all because it's so fast. Now, when we're wrong, and we often are wrong, we can correct thinking fast with slow, laborious thinking slow. Now the neurological instinctive model does capture the speed with which we make moral choice. It captures the profound inner penetration of reason and emotion in moral judgment, and it captures that sense of virtue being mysterious to us, of not knowing we had it in us. So an emphasis on the intuitive, instinctive character of morality seems more psychologically realistic than those philosophical accounts that model our moral reasoning as if our minds were a calculating machine, testing the applicability of rules by process of deduction. Recent neuroscience, moreover, has uncovered the physical processes in the brain that appear to generate moral behavior. We've learned, for example, and it's fascinating, that when patients are put through brain scans, we can see different areas of their brain light up when classical moral dilemmas are presented to them. But what still remains unexplained is how chemical and biological processes are translated into intentions and actions. Going back to our primary example, what exactly would we learn were a neurologist to tell us that certain zones of Cleveringa's brain were especially activated in the stressful weeks before his decision? Almost certainly they were. Presumably other brains at Leiden were similarly activated by the widely rumored news of the impending dismissal of Jewish professors and university staff. And we know that in the weeks before the action, Cleveringa records that he felt a physical pressure in his brain and a constant sense of stress that he had to release. If we can't understand how these instinctual reactions, perhaps felt by many others, were translated into his specific actions, we have no account of the singularity, the singularity of ethical judgment. And so the central difficulty with neurological instinctual theory is that it gives us a biological account of how our emotions work that may explain aggregate and aggregate behaviors in large groups, but fails to give us a story about what's surely distinctive 
about your moral experience and mine, which is that it's ours and ours alone, and we experience it as ours alone. Neurological instinctive theory holds moreover that moral patterns are hardwired in the brain through a millennial process of environmental adaptation. Thus we're wired to accord moral preferences to kith and kin over strangers, to be aggressive and defensive in relation to aliens, prone to favoritism, nepotism, and other forms of ethical partiality, to blood relatives, and others whose well-being has survival value. Environmental adaptation through natural selection also provides an account of how cultures of morality change through time. In particular, how ethical codes emerge to restrain forms of selfishness that will damage the group. We can explain, for example, the slow emergence of the idea of equality before the law as an adaptive solution to the tribe's problem of adjudicating competing selfish interests for the sake of group cohesion and survival. And it would seem that the most impressive achievements of human culture are precisely those that restrain selfish ethical partiality. The problem with Darwinian explanation is that while it can explain slow change over millennia in the culture of ethics, it has much more difficulty explaining what we constantly experience in our own life, namely rapid change in ethical culture. Because if the first defining element of our moral life in the 21st century is that we experience it as our own, the second element is that we decide nowadays in a situation of almost constant moral upheaval. Our supposedly hardwired instincts change so rapidly that it's difficult to understand them as Darwinian adaptations based on natural selection. So for example, from the 1880s to 1945, virulent anti-Semitism was a commonplace of many groups in European culture. In 2013, it is the delusion of a marginalized few. In 1960, it would have been relatively easy in the American South to find whites physically repelled at the prospect of sharing washroom facilities with American blacks. Today, these feelings have vanished or at least disappeared from public expression. Similarly, in 1960, it would have been easy to find heterosexuals physically repelled by the prospect or the very idea of homosexual behavior. In 2013, these instincts of repulsion are happily restricted to a vanishing minority. So that what appears to be instinctual, natural, tribal, hardwire is actually susceptible to historical change in the short run. And if so, our deepest emotions respond to opinion, language, politics, and legislation. But if that's the case, we need a theory that would explain how change in moral language works its way into our synapses. My point is not to question that moral action is rooted in instinctual reactions or biological processes, but rather to ask exactly how biochemical processes shape individual action, especially in the case we're considering. Because it would have been adaptive for him to stay silent, adaptive for him to keep his head down, sensible to avoid confronting the issue. He acted against prudence, against self-interest, even against his own survival. Can instinctive neurological accounts give us a story of such singular decision-making? And can these accounts explain how moral lives change? For we need to see Cleveringa as an agent of change, one of those individuals whose singular acts disgraced commonplace anti-Semitism forever. We're here tonight, after all, because he and others like him succeeded in changing the culture of our own lives. And if we are tribal beings, moreover, hardwired to favor those close to us, how is it that our tribal feelings are so labile, so subject to variation? More basically, which tribe do we think we belong to? Which tribe, religion, family, race, gender, 
determines our moral instincts. In the dean's decision, we see that, at, for him at least, nothing was, it was instinctual. The question of loyalty and belonging was one he had to decide for himself. Should he think of himself as a Gentile and Myers as a Jew? Or should he think of them both as Dutchmen, members of the university, and fellow scholars of law? Only the Nazis and their Dutch sympathizers thought a choice like that should be instinctual. It's not merely that Cleveringa had to decide which tribe he belonged to. It, this was part of a still larger challenge of deciding who he was. The deciding moral self is not a given. Instinctual neurological and rational deductive models of judgment both assume a stable, unencumbered self. But this takes for granted precisely what has to be constituted. Because the fact is, we're a mystery to ourselves. And in moments of moral crisis, we ask, who in this scene do I wish to be? Whose values do I wish to enact? Moral action can serve both as an affirmation of who we are, but it also can represent our fervent wish to be better than we are, to redeem ourselves in our own eyes and in the eyes of others. So our first act of imagination is to settle on which character we will play in the moral theater. The decision to ban Myers forced Cleveringa to decide who he wished to be in his own eyes and in the eyes of a watching audience. And interestingly, the person whose opinion mattered most to him was his wife. He consulted with her constantly. A close relationship like this is a moral theater in which our deepest sense of self-worth is tied to their sense of who we are. We know from Cleveringa's memoirs that he was only at peace with his decision when he knew that he could count on his wife's support. We also know that she came from a liberal Mennonite family. This doesn't mean that specific religious doctrine determined their choice. While Cleveringa makes reference to God, he does not convey any sense that he secures guidance from above, yet there seems little doubt that Mennonite Protestantism plays a role in framing how he sees himself as a moral actor. He takes it as a fact of his situation that he must choose. And that's not a natural fact. That's almost the key decision he has to make, that he has a choice and that he must make it and that if he makes it, he has to live with it for the rest of his life. Only certain moral frames set that up as your obligation. The second place in which Cleveringa's choice is framed is by this university itself. Leiden has been his life. He's taught there for his entire career. His closest friends and colleagues are members of the community. His connection to Myers is at once institutional and personal. He's Myers' former student. And as dean, he's nominally Myers' superior. Basic to Cleveringa's self-understanding is that he belongs to a free community. If bastion of liberty is to have any meaning whatever, it must mean that the hiring, promotion, and dismissal of professors should be based on teaching and scholarly ability and not on race or religion. And this is precisely what's at stake in the Myers case. As you know, in October 1940, the Reichskommissar had forced all Dutch public servants, including university teachers, to sign a declaration stating that they were Aryan or face dismissal. Cleveringa and his friend Telders had objected. In private, Cleveringa had called this decision monstrous, and together they protested to the Dutch Supreme Court in The Hague. To their immense disappointment, the court judges themselves signed the Aryan Declaration, indicating that it was lawful. Eighteen Leiden professors had initially refused to sign the declaration, but in the end all of them signed, believing that further protest was futile. On the 23rd of November, all 31, 31 Jewish employees of this university were dismissed, including the two professors. Cleveringa was one of those who signed the declaration. But his signature bothered him, and his unease proved a decisive catalyst. 
Once he signed, weeks of guilt, doubt, and rising inner tension followed. The key issue, as Severinga came to see it, was not simply what he owed Myers, the individual, but what he owed the institution at large. He was able to see this because he made the decision with his colleagues and with the student body, I should add. The choice to address the students was jointly taken at a faculty meeting. And once that collective decision was taken, Ben Telders, interestingly, immediately volunteered to speak, arguing that as he had no wife or children, he did not face the same pressure as the married faculty. But it was at that point, that precise point, and after consulting his wife, that Klemveringa stepped up and declared that as dean, the responsibility was his. And when he met later with students, the student role here is extremely important. The students told him that they looked to him and to the professoriate for leadership. So here we see two institutions, marriage and a family on the one hand, and, an, and a university on the other, framing moral duty. In this crucible, Cleveringa considered and rejected an important alternative, the idea that he should use the occasion of his speech merely to express human sympathy. I quote, if I were to limit myself to a compassionate expression and a compassionate word, it would have seemed like a betrayal to me. I could not be so passive. I needed to seriously express myself. What was at stake, he now saw, was no longer compassion for a friend, but loyalty to the idea of justice that the institution and his country had to stand for. And as he later recalled, no criteria such as values, scholarship, merit, humanity, or citizenship would be decisive or would count except merely the Jewish descent. For our feeling that was pure arbitrariness, a sinking into the darkness of our past where from our people had already come. It went against everything we were used to here in the Netherlands, which was considered our most precious cultural trait. So his audience that November morning understood his deed in exactly the same way he did. And when the students began singing the national anthem, it was their way of acknowledge, uh, it was their way of acknowledging that he had defined everyone in this hall as citizens of a state under occupation and members of a community fighting for its freedom. The neurological instinctual models of moral choice fail to accord a role to the moral imagination of both speaker and audience in framing the meeting they shared in the hall that morning. Moral instincts of this complex sort are not triggered, they are constituted, brought to consciousness and then to action through the agency of historically created meanings bequeathed to individuals by their institutions. Yet even here, institutionally inherited meanings are not determinative. We need to leave a role for singular moral leadership in making these meanings come alive to an audience. If leadership articulates the moral tradition of a free institution, then we have an account of his actions that appears to return us to rational deductive modes of explanation. These have the advantage over the neurological instinctive in according to cognition, to thinking, and hence to choice a determining role in moral decision making. If cognition is involved, it can be singular. We all think for ourselves. It can give us an account at the individual level of what the decision making process means. And if rational deduction is involved, it embraces language. And once it embraces language and metaphor, it embraces historicity and change. So we can begin to understand how moral actors reinterpret the rules over time. Now these rational deductive approaches to moral decision making reflect what philosophers think we ought to do when we face a moral dilemma. Now, what they want us to do is to reason, to pare away the penumbra of extraneous circumstances, identify the relevant specifics, and then methodically evaluate what we should do against roughly two forms of reasoning, utilitarian or deontological models of evaluation. Philosophers study how we make moral decisions by studying complex hypotheticals. And some of the philosophy students in this audience will know what I'm talking about. These trolley problems test the limits of consequential reasoning when lives are on the line, and they illustrate the ongoing tension in our hearts and minds between deontological and consequentialist rationales for handling moral dilemmas. 
But the question is whether most of us actually do make moral choices the way philosophers say we should. Because our life is not a trolley problem. It's not a cleaned up hypothetical. And as cognitive psychologists point out, real life decisions involving real people trigger deep emotion that are inseparably implicated when we attempt to apply reason to our dilemmas. When faced with real life dilemmas, we don't reason like philosophers. And as Judas Sklar pointed out 60 years ago, we don't reason like lawyers or judges either. Judas Sklar counseled against legalism in our moral thinking, the tendency to think of moral conduct as a, quote, matter of rule following and moral relationships as duties and rights determined by rules. If we return to the case in question and to the philosophers, neither utilitarianism nor Kantianism, those beautiful machines, seem to have come out of their glass cases and been pressed into service as the dean made up his mind. As Hleveringa himself recalled, I cannot say that I weighed everything with a cool mind. My heart and conscience called upon me quickly, decisively, intensely. It pounded into me several times. I felt tense, moved, and under pressure, which I had to get rid of. Philosophers may see his decision-making process as a deontological versus a consequentialist choice, but if so, it radically simplifies what was at stake for him. For Clever Inga, the relevant, the relevant frame of decision-making was not cast in the utilitarian language of costs and benefits. It was cast in a much different language, the language of honor and the language of shame. At stake were family honor and the honor of this institution. This is not to say he did not weigh consequences. He worried what would happen to his daughters if he were arrested and taken away. But what worried him even more was what they would think of him if he remained silent. In particular, he worried that if he did nothing and they survived him, they would live with a tainted name. If this is consequentialist reasoning, it's of a very particular kind, because it actually imagines a future in which his daughters survive him, and the question is whether their name is honored. This is where we see, once again, the constitutive role of imagined futures in determining his choices. And in order to appreciate how exceptional this capacity to imagine the future is, we need to remember the date. It's November 1940. In November 1940, the Nazi occupation of Holland was only six months old. All of Europe lay at Hitler's feet. Across the Channel, London lay in ruins. Across the Atlantic, the Americans were still on the sidelines. On Europe's eastern frontier, the Russians still remained Hitler's allies. From one end of Europe to the other, the Nazis were proclaiming the birth of a thousand-year-old Reich. Hence, it's not coercion alone that made the Dutch people submit to occupied rule but a conviction about time, their conviction that the Nazis owned and defined the future. In such a frame of time, resistance, needless to say, was useless. That's how we can begin to understand why a sizable percentage of the Dutch population, perhaps as many as one in five, either sympathized with the German occupation or actually joined the NSB, the local Nazi party. They did so either because they were believers or because they were opportunists, but either way, they assumed that a thousand-year-old Reich was not a boast, but a reasonable bet on a likely future. That's why I think, and it's on the basis of that future, an imagined future of a thousand-year-old Reich, that the rector of this university, Frederick Muller, gave an address in September 1940, probably in this hall, glorifying the principle of principle of authoritarian leadership and looking forward to a future in which, quote, our Dutch nation will finally become accustomed to discipline. It's the same vision of a shortened, uh, of a future eternally under Nazi rule that led the NSB mayor, who was imposed on the town of Leiden, 
to declare in 1941 that some sacrifice of university values was justifiable at this time of crisis of European culture, unquote. These counterexamples allow you to see just how exceptional Meyer's vision of a different future actually was. He affirmed his faith in a future beyond the imaginative reach of all but a few of his countrymen and women. But to be able to imagine such a future, however, he had to feel the strength of a living past. And this is why no Leiden, no Cleveringa. For the auditorium, the hall in which he spoke, this very hall, built in the late Middle Ages and used by the university since 1581, had existed centuries before the German invasion. It was the place where the adolescent Grotius had learned his law. The very bricks and mortars of this room proclaimed, we survived the Spanish siege of this city and we will outlast the Germans. These halls endure, Cleveringa could say to himself, and because they do, there will come a time when the usurpers will be gone, when the community can once again define who belongs in this place, not by race, but by scholarship. And it is this imagined time future that calls forth his act of courage. Not all ancient institutions speak to their members in the same way. If I've criticized neurological instinctive models for reducing meaning to biology, I better not replace them with models in which history determines the conscience. Institutions are not determinative. As we have seen, not everyone in Leiden took the same message from the walls of the place that the dean did. In few other ancient universities anywhere in Europe did deans and professors stand up for Jewish colleagues in Bologna, in Tübingen, in the great medieval universities of Europe, how many professors actually stood up to speak the meaning of the walls that they inhabited. In the University of Berlin, for example, Karl Schmidt, Nazi theorist, spent a pleasant 1930s, happy that Jewish colleagues had been driven into exile or arrested, believing in the future Hitler wanted to create for Europe. The point here is a little bleak. There's never any certainty that the traditions in a community of learning will call forth the best in people. In Leiden, this happened to be the case, and it's a matter of sorrow and some perplexity that other intellectuals failed to see that the institutions they served had survived. Earlier tyrannies would survive. If institutions they served had survived earlier tyrannies, it would survive this one. But this is what Leiden's walls seem to say to the dean. Leveringa's faith is an example of what the American philosopher Jonathan Lear has called radical hope. The hope is radical because it requires a sustained imaginative projection of faith beyond a desperate present. Radical hope is something more than optimistic hopefulness something more than Mr. Micawber's belief that something is bound to turn up. It's not the belief that the future will be bright for me. It's rather a belief in a collective future for all that will redeem a blighted present. Most frequently, radical hope takes the form of a political ideology or creed. For nearly 150 years in Europe, for example, communists fought and died in the name of a radiant tomorrow laying down their very lives, but also laying down the lives of millions of others for the construction of a socialist paradise that receded inexorably with every step they took towards it. Leveringa's faith, needless to say, was of a very different order. His faith that Myers would return did not depend upon any political ideology we can detect. It was simply the quiet, modest faith that loyalty, scholarship, and ties of citizenship would prevail over murderous opportunism in a Holland that one day would see the back of the occupiers. In 1940 and 1941, such radical hope was in desperately short supply, but it was not entirely absent even in the darkest places, even in the prison yards of occupied France, for example 
When young Résistants were taken out to be shot in 1941, we know from those who listened from the adjacent cells that as they went to their death, they cried, Vive la France! These words are more than patriotic defiance. They have a temporal dimension. They affirm faith in a France of tomorrow that would remember and value their sacrifice. I'd also cite the case of Primo Levi in Auschwitz in late 1944, circling the exercise yard with a fellow prisoner. They are both clad in filthy rags, they are ill with fever, and they are both struggling to recall some lines from Dante. When they finally remembered the lines, Levy later recalled, they felt overwhelmed, as if a trumpet had sounded in darkness. And the lines which I translate poorly in English are, consider your seed, you were not made to live like brutes, but to follow virtue and knowledge. In recalling these lines to memory, Primo Levi and his friends succeeded in transporting themselves, if only for one moment, into a future, into a world in which people could freely exchange lines of poetry. This imagined future rekindled their longing to live, to endure, and to survive. We now live in this future, and so we should ask in conclusion what we must do to be worthy of their example. If the university made Cleveringa's act of solidarity possible, we need to ask ourselves whether universities today remain capable of the same. Does the university, does this university, does my university still function as a moral community, capable of standing up for its members when their freedom and dignity are challenged? Frankly, we do not know the answer until the challenge arises and Cleveringa's message is that we better be ready. All we actually know is that in this place, a single individual and some noble friends were empowered to stand up for each other and to rise in defense of the best traditions of this place. Many others did not. Moving beyond this community, what right does Dutch society have to claim Cleveringa's legacy? What right does the society as a whole have to claim this legacy? Here we have to face the reality, well known to all of you, that 80% of the Dutch Jews, citizens of this country, perished in the Holocaust, and that's a higher percentage than anywhere in Europe other than Germany and Poland. There are many explanations of this, the particularly violent and oppressive character of Nazi rule in Holland, but we must also mention the strength of the Dutch Nazi party and the willingness of Dutch administrators to facilitate the deportation and murder of their fellow citizens. Evidently, not all Dutch people of that generation behaved in the same way. We know this because the percentage of Jews saved in Holland varied markedly from place to place. In some cases, citizens hid and saved their fellow citizens. And in this city, Leiden, for example, more than 50% of the Jews survived the war. In other famous cases, the Amsterdam dock workers, for example, went on strike to protest the rounding up of their fellow citizens. But in other cases, the moral reality was darker and active collaboration was the rule rather than the exception. We can only conclude that in this country and in many parts of occupied Europe, common bonds of citizenship turned out to be too weak to stand up to the barbarism of Nazi rule. Once citizenship no longer proved strong enough to protect the Jews, common humanity sometimes did step into the breach created by the collapse of citizenship. Simple pity, compassion, and empathy did inspire acts of re rescue. But again, this was the exception, not the rule. We have to reflect deeply on the fact that when Jews were stripped of citizenship, expelled from communities, forced to wear the yellow star, when they could only appeal to compassion among their fellow human beings, it was more than too late. Jews across Europe were to discover the bitter truth in Hannah Arendt's words, written in 1948, and I quote, it seems that a man who is nothing but a man 
has lost the very qualities that make it possible for other people to treat him as a fellow man. We must acknowledge the difficult fact that human rights alone cannot protect the vulnerable. Their protection depends more on securing rights of citizenship, membership bonds in strong communities like universities, neighborly ties, and friendship too. When these ties are absent, shared recognition of common humanity is weak. Myers was defended and he was saved because he was a professor and a member of a community proud enough of itself to rise in his defense. These are some of the lessons we can draw on from the courage displayed here one November morning in 1940. We must strengthen the institutions so that we can accept a common obligation to stand up for each other, extend citizenship so all shelter under equal rights, be unbending in ensuring that the rule of law applies to all, and we must have the imagination to understand that fascism is never securely in our past. Indeed, terror can be incubated in democracy. We should fight constantly against the besetting sin of democratic politics, dem demagogues who trade on prejudice and fear and seek to rally us against a supposed them. In a democratic society, there is no them. There is only us. Goodness is fragile, a philosopher once said. Leveringa's example is respected best when we acknowledge how rare it was. And we must ask ourselves whether we have the capacity to believe so fervently in a better future that we make it our judge. Since we know that such imagining is hard, the truest way to honor Leveringa tonight is to leave this hall asking with a troubled heart whether we would be capable of what he did here in this place 73 years ago today. Thank you. <laughs>